Okay, uh, last day of lectures. Welcome everybody. Today we have a second day of final presentations and then uh, some final review for your exam. So let's uh, see if uh, Henry, Robert Peralta and Robert Rudio are ready. You guys can take it from here. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Robert R and my teammates are Henry and Robert P. And we are presenting our 192.3 femtojoules uh, for bit absolute value detector. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for our circuit topology, uh, similar to other groups, instead of doing separate logic for absolute value and comparator, um, we went for the combined approach. Uh, that is, if x is negative, um, we can just add it to the threshold and check if the result is negative. And if the result is negative, then absolute value of x is greater than the threshold. And if x is positive, then we can just turn it into negative, then apply the same logic. Um, for the circuit style, uh, for the MUX, we are using PDL, and the rest are all in CMOS. Uh, our target is minimal energy with mirrored layout while keeping the delay under 750 seconds. Um, here's our three worst case delays with 697 picoseconds being the worst. Um, for our layout size, we were able to get an area of 279.1 micrometers squared with an aspect ratio of 1.425. Um, for our schematic energy, we use we have 166 femtojoules, and for layout, we have 192.3 femtojoules. Um, for our schematic VDD, we use 0 0.62, and for our layout, uh, we have 0 0.648. We were able to pass um, old verification, including function, DRC, and LVS. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as I said earlier, uh, if X is negative, we want to be able to turn it into a, oh, sorry, if X is positive, we want to turn it into a negative. So here we have a MOX that chooses between X0 and X0, oh, sorry, X1, bar, X1 and X1 bar, X2 and X2 bar, and X3 and X3 bar, which is controlled by X3. And in addition to flipping the bits, we also want to add one. So here we can see X3 into an inverter which is the plus one logic of our circuit. Um, since we only need uh, the sign bit of T plus X, we didn't need the full adder, so we only implemented the C out of the full adder. Um, on our critical path, it starts from X0, goes through an inverter and a MOX through a carry out inverter chain. So our three T critical is three T inverter for a steep T MOX and 3 TCL. Uh, next slide, please. Hi, I'm Henry, and I'll be explaining the gate sizing and energy optimization. So, first up is our C out block, which we use a mirror adder static CMOS design. And as Robert said, we strip the adder portion because we only need to find out whether our input is greater and not by how much. And this saves on overhead. And so we decided to size this to a unit inverter. And um, next slide, please. So here is our MUX. We used PTL logic with less transistors. And um, our approach was to optimize energy. Um, our intuition was that um, despite not having full swing output, it's surrounded by other CMOS logic with regenerative properties. And then they're all sized the same. Um, next slide, please. Um, here is our static CMOS inverter, and we just used unit reference inverter sizing. And then we also experimented with a cap filler cell, um, as we said in lecture, with the source drain and bulk grounded, and it's acting as a capacitor to, to provide decoupling capacitance to the circuit to um, lessen VDD um, spikes when it's transitioning. So next slide, please. Yeah, so here is our energy and VDD. So we originally analyzed our um, critical path X naught with an arbitrary VDD from the test bench, but then 
we made our custom test bench and then we tried every input combination with X naught that resulted in an output change. And so we found specific um, input vectors and then iteratively, iteratively optimized VDD. And so we brought it up um, to 0 0.62 for the schematic. And then we did the same process for a layout, except um, we also found that another critical path X3 was um, also a factor. So Robert will explain that a little bit later. But um, our goal was to minimize the test bench energy while making sure the critical path delay was as close to 700 picoseconds, but under with the safety buffer. So yes, thank you. Next slide. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so these are our uh, schematic critical paths. Um, as mentioned before, they all fall along that X0 path uh, with various input vectors and different thresholds. Um, the delays are slightly different because the inputs expose different amounts of intrinsic capacitances uh, between inverters, uh, between transistors, rather. Um, but yeah, you can you can see there, we pushed it up on the schematic. We pushed it up pretty close to 700 picoseconds since uh, we didn't have to worry about parasitics. Um, yeah, and next slide, please. And so post layout, you can see that our worst critical path is actually along a different path, along X3. Um, the second and third worst paths are still the first two worst paths from the schematic, which is what you expect. Um, and X3 was an interesting one that popped up. And I'll explain that a little bit later, but you can see the inputs here. It was the low high transition of X3. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, we can see our layout. Um, so we can see it's, it's a little bit hard, our annotations kind of cover it, but because X3 is a select bit for our MUX uh, and also an input into our carryout logic, we needed uh, to run it along routing on metal four, which meant a lot of vias and a lot of long wires. So we believe that it was wire parasitics that ended up pushing the X3 path over that of X0. Um, notably, because the X3 path goes through the MUX, it actually shares most of the critical path with X0. Um, so they're essentially equivalent, but the, the parasitics were what pushed it over in the layout. Um, taking a look at our layout, you can see that we have a chain of our we have a row of muxes and inverters along the top and our inverter carry out chain along the bottom. Uh, we used shared VDD and ground rails to make everything nice and symmetrical. Um, we used stack transistors to squeeze everything in. Um, our annotations don't quite show it. Our PR boundaries aren't butted up next to each other because we had to keep N wells far enough apart, uh, but that left us room for routing. Um, and like the others mentioned, we had an area of 278.96 microns squared. Our, ax our aspect ratio was just under the requirement at 1.4. Our cell density was about 60%. Um, and you can see our critical path now X3 as it goes from the bottom left inverter through the MUX and then back through the carryout logic. And I think that's everything. Thank you. Okay, very nice job, guys. Very nice and clean. Um, I just uh, wonder if you had uh, thought about strategies to um, increase the density of your layout. Uh, I, I think uh, we may be coming to the same question as before uh, on the end wells. Uh, if that created uh, the major, what was the major spacing, I guess, limitation for uh, you guys? Yeah, it did. It did end up being. Um and wells between the inverters and the carryout logic specifically. Uh -huh. um, that bottom chain was our limiting factor. Um, there was, we did experiment with using the inversion principle in our carryout chain to eliminate some inverters perhaps. Um, we did some rudimentary tests at the schematic stage and found that delay and energy weren't actually any better, mm -hmm. although we may have missed something with sizing. Um, so we didn't end up using that, but that could definitely help us compact things down if we got rid of a couple inverters. Yeah, and I, I like here how you uh, made a nice consideration of critical path to line up cells pretty much like straight up uh, and uh, minimize the length of those wires. So that's really uh, well done. Thank you guys, this was great.